You know, I love YouTube critics. They really give an insight to a person more so than any conversation with them would. You see, their interests, their goals, their intentions, right down to the flesh. It's all revealed. They're naked, alone, and you can see it. So I think what we need to do here today is really delve into the minds of them. The minds of the world. And the mind of you. Let's peel back the layers of Outlast and really shine a light on the whole thing. Since I, I really feel that the reality of the situation is that it takes time. Time to grow, time to learn, and to heal. And you know, people just don't take their time anymore. And that's why there's people like me. That's why I'm right here. And welcome to a critique of Outlast. Now, for those who have seen much of the content of this channel, you will be aware that I've tackled many horror games in depth, and that you probably assumed this was coming. This series will analyze and spoil everything about Outlast. If you would like to skip the introduction, then please go to this timestamp right now. During my previous videos, I have alluded to Outlast being a game that I not only do not like, but one that I think isn't very well made. This perspective was crafted from very little experience with the game, and so when I started receiving requests to cover games, I figured I would simply approach the games that I was passionate about or very interested in and sort of ignore the requests. But as time went on, I figured that I could very easily give the game the Mola treatment and play it several times, taking it seriously to really figure out what was going on with the game and what I truly thought about it. Outlast is an interesting game. Lead developers reference Rubber Johnny, a strange YouTube video about a deformed man locked in a basement viewed at many points in the video in Night Vision, which is one of the main influences for the game's own Night Vision. While I think it's clear that the imagery in the Night Vision were almost entirely inspired from this, they definitely added their own flair. The next influence the developers cite is Amnesia The Dark Descent. Now you guys probably know my feelings on that game since I've made them relatively clear over the hours of critical analysis I've provided, but for those who don't, it is my undisputed favorite horror game and my pick for the best horror game humanity has to currently offer if we were strictly talking about having your player experience extreme fear. Now when Amnesia came out, I got fully enveloped in its incredibly well put together design. I was raring to go on the next horror game that was recommended since that was the only reason I played Amnesia in the first place. So then I see hundreds of funny compilation videos of people getting scared in Amnesia, and this was a little disheartening because people began to claim that Amnesia had the best jump scares, the most gory and the most terrifying in your face horror game in existence. That wasn't what I played. Not the subtlety, the understanding of human behavior, and the experience as a whole. I was a little annoyed, but ultimately it got Amnesia a shit ton of exposure. Then Outlast was released, and then everyone else was releasing these videos. But there was one key difference, something that we'll get stuck into as this series progresses. Now, I was fully on board to play this new great horror game, so I bought it. Played it for two hours, got a bit bored, and found that I didn't have a single urge to continue. I figured it may have been that I simply had other stuff to do, but most of the time, if you feel a game is truly good, you will make time for it. So something was wrong. After my stream knew about my love for Amnesia, they wanted me to complete Outlast, thus making me at least give the game a full chance. And by the time I got to the end, I had a plethora of things to say to explain why I hated it. Time went on and I forgot these reasons, but kept the conclusion. Fast forward to my own snide comments about the game in other videos, and I riled up a commenter here or there, so I decided... I would actually make this video series. In order to do that, I streamed the game to completion twice on normal difficulty, played the game five times offline, and did a few test runs which amounts to about nine recorded full playthroughs of the campaign. And I threw in a bunch of playthroughs for Whistleblower as well. 
There is a hell of a lot to get through, and once again I have spent too much time on this, but it is becoming a staple of my work. I have looked at the top 30 reviews, or critiques, or analysis of Outlast, and I was relatively dumbfounded that I was coming up pretty much dry. Our old favourite, GGG Man Lives, has a video on it, we had Smosh and IGN, etc. But nobody else of note really at all, and I realised it was because this was just before the advent of crazy short and terrible reviews. I mean, GGG Man Lives got in pretty early, so that might explain his success, interestingly enough. But as of recently, we have Noah Caldwell Gervais, or Noah Caldwell Gervais, I've heard both pronunciations, sorry if I've uh, got that wrong. But he was making another one of his patented long-form analyses, taking what appears to be one topic and running with it extensively. Now, I've been told about Noah, but I haven't had a chance to explore his content because he hasn't covered topics that I have a current interest in. Until now. I was finally able to check him out, and we will get to that. So yeah, we will be seeing a rather large amount of very amateur reviewers making silly videos and making silly mistakes. Hello, YouTube citizens. Greetings, programs. Hello, all you beef queefs. What's up, guys? What is up, guys? Hey, guys. Freddy Corn here. I am Retro Hero. Hey, what is Mika Boost? This is Jay. Hello, this is D-Labs. My name is Angus Morrison. It's Lord Mankey. Adam here. It's me, Kyo Killer. Dear's the nerd here. This is Philly Cuts. Welcome to my review of Outlast. Today I have a review for um, Outlast. Um, we're going to do another game review. This time it's the game Outlast. <laughs> As we go through this game, we'll be checking out their perspective and points respectively. Though, seriously guys, look at the strange fucking obsession those days had for intro effects. Like, this isn't all of them, but this is a selection from the 30. <laughs> Why are you so tense, God damn it? Good game. Radio. It's the Whitey Show. Such a blast from the past. People used to think that intros like that gave their videos a sense of professionalism and consistency. But nowadays, people prefer the videos start immediately, and the clickbait titles are the more concerning thing now. Anyway, since this includes many of, let's say, a different quality of YouTube reviewer, we'll get some weird shit. Uh, soundtrack that's scary. Scary as a picture of my grandma. Some funny shit. This game is really intense. There were a couple of times during the playtime that I had where I had to take quite a few breaks. Um, cause you know, it, well, not only that, and cause it was school and I had to go to bed. Some confusing shit. I mean, is this 8 out of 18? Like, I, I don't know, this is Smosh. You guys would have, like, the best funding out of all these people, but you couldn't pick a solid font? And then you have the fake as fuck shit. Like, look at this, when you have, like, two people who feel like they don't actually know what a video game is and were sent from Zorgad to discover human interaction with media, Look at this scene transition. He's making this weird, scared face, and then he's like, Oh, fuck, we're moving on from the funny? No, no more funny? Oh, okay, it's time to put my my standard face back on and talk some shit. This, this is the kind of shit where it feels like they're reporting the weather. Regardless, I have once again noticed a lot of patterns, and we will go through them, but as this is the introduction, I would only want to provide the relevant information about red barrels and, I guess, the premise for the video. Um, so let's do that. The thing is, I feel like we already have that. Red Barrels are a selection of people who are interested in making a horror game with two major influences. However, many people felt the need to mention what the team had worked on previously. Prince of Persia, Assassin's Creed, and the Splinter Cell series. 
Prince of Persia, Assassin's Creed, and Uncharted. Assassin's Creed, Uncharted, Prince of Persia, and Splinter Cell. Splinter Cell, Assassin's Creed, and Prince of Persia. The reason this is so odd to me is that nobody develops this information, they just say it. Which is similar with a lot of the fact sections of the reviews, almost like some of them might have just been reading the Wikipedia pages. It is often relevant to point out the previous experience or influence for a developer team, but I didn't see the connection here. The fact is, I don't really feel that those previous games have shit all to do with Outlast. The best you could say is that they added minor levels of parkour to the game, as they may have been influenced from those other games, but that isn't even relevant since they wouldn't have needed to develop those games to have been inspired to do parkour in, in Outlast. At least Penumbra gives us the groundwork for amnesia in terms of the engine, the mechanics, and the tone, but what would Prince of Persia have to do with Outlast? <sighs> I, I, I digress. I ran the game at maximum settings and it ran without a hitch, so it'll be nice compared to the toxic sludge appearing on my last series. Also, you may see footage of the camera zooming ineffectively, and that's because my stupid mouse wheel is busted and I can't afford a new mouse right now, so don't worry about me not knowing how zoom works, it's literally just something that's not working right. As you're all aware, I'm a huge fan of Amnesia The Dark Descent, and I believe that not only did Outlast ape a bunch of ideas out of Amnesia, but it missed a lot of what made those very ideas effective, so you'll be seeing it pop up through the series as a clear identified influence from the developers. And as I mentioned previously, Noah has made a video covering Outlast, Whistleblower, and Outlast 2. I'm going to respond to him since he is probably the most in-depth and influential of all the people positing perspectives on the game. And I'll do it in secluded areas of the videos because his points are a little bit more abstract and to be fair, I'll only be responding to the Outlast portion of his video, which is around about 10 minutes. So why not start here with an example? The camera is practically iconic to Outlast. The night vision view is something that everyone will picture when thinking about the game. What would you describe it as? Well, you use night vision, that allows you to see in the dark. That's it, right? It's basically night vision in any game that has utilized it previously. Nothing incredibly special about it as a mechanic, but if you add the fact that the origin of it is a camera, and you have a small red number in the top left corner displaying a recording time, then it becomes not just a night vision mode, but a representation of found footage genre in video games, right? As for found footage in video games, I would say it's pretty much unheard of. Outlast is probably the first mainstream game to use found footage throughout the majority of its runtime, and if not that, it's definitely the first game I've played that does found footage justice in video games. Wrong. There is nothing additional in terms of gameplay mechanics about the heads-up display. The found footage genre in film is in reference to work like The Blair Witch Project, Record, and Cloverfield. These movies are completely indistinguishable from being a tape someone recorded in pieces and you are watching the resulting footage. This allows the genre to take many caveats in terms of quality, but engages the audience in what can be utilized as an intimate, familiar, and immersive format. I'm going to go on record and say that there is very little for video games to gain from the found footage movie genre, just as it would be entirely foolish to convert a silent film to a book. A game relies on interaction, and found footage relies on events having transpired, and we simply view them. This is antithetical to video gaming. Aside from that, what could video games possibly have to gain from the genre? Typically speaking, it is a jarring experience to watch a movie from first person, but video games are often viewed from that perspective. So what else is there? What use is found footage to the video game industry as a genre? What does it add? Outlast isn't even the closest we've come to this genre being converted to a video game. The early 2017 Resident Evil 7 had the protagonist finding tapes in which predetermined events took place. What the game allowed was the freedom to explore the linear progression in small ways, to delay the movement and thus potentially find collectibles, but most of all to gain information that could assist you in the main game when you visit the same area. This is something far more akin to found footage, yet still requires an actual game behind it to make it feasible. Regardless of that, let me entertain some arguments from an alternate perspective. Instead of a gun, you have a camcorder. It's your only way to navigate the dark and labyrinthine spaces of the Mount Massive Insane Asylum. It's your only way to interact. You observe. You run, jump, creep, and you document. The camcorder records everything you witness while you're holding it up. At the end of the game, my camcorder said I had a little under two hours of recorded footage, just about the exact length of a horror movie. Now, upon hearing this for the first time, I can't say I really understood where he was going with it, since as I stated, there are simply numbers in the top left. There's no tangible result of the camera being operated. In fact, the camera is simply a modification of your HUD, that being a grain filter and a green tinge to the screen. 
Therefore, what makes this system any different from any night vision or recording software in any game previously? And what does this add to the mechanics of a video game? The answer is of course nothing tangible. It is whatever you can apply to the content yourself. An abstract concept of a finished recording that could potentially be a watchable movie if it actually existed. But what does that matter at all? You could say the same for any horror game that you cut up. Besides, it would be far too long. Noah talks about how the just about exact length of a horror movie is two hours, despite the fact that it has been closer to an hour and a half. If you look at the more popular horror films of modern times, even accounting for the ones that have found footage, the runtime equates to about an hour and 38, so... Not really exact, is it? Not that I even know why this is mentioned, to be honest, since, as I said, any game could potentially be turned into a found footage movie since they're all in first person for the most part. I feel like this is an absolutely unnecessary comparison and it adds nothing to the conversation, but there's more to this, I'm sure. Outlast is a horror game that uses found footage the opposite way a movie would. It uses it to limit the player, to reduce their options, to simplify the, the purpose. It doesn't rely on the presumed novelty of a first-person perspective. It leverages the first-person perspective that's already assumed to be common into something more claustrophobic than usual for a game of its genre. So what I can understand from that statement is that he's saying that we kind of take the vision and audio from a standard first-person perspective on video games for granted. We see and hear everything that is of the real world, while in Outlast, we do not. We have limited vision and distracting noises, and he's attributing this to the reversal of the way a movie uses found footage. This literally makes no sense whatsoever. I don't think I have to remind you guys that Frictional were the ones who said that sensory deprivation is incredibly important in a video game. If you have only weird sounds and limited vision to work with, it'll make you much more immersed into the horror game's very limited sense of sound and vision. This has nothing to do with simply Outlast. It's just a good move to make in an atmospheric survival horror game. Besides, movies do not use found footage to provide the player or viewer options or to vary their purpose. An Outlast having limited options or simplified purpose could not possibly be attributed to found footage or the reverse intentions of found footage. This feels incredibly difficult to explain because the purpose of my videos is to try and simplify all of the more high concept arguments and whenever I come across a word I feel like the majority of people don't have a similar understanding of, I try and explain it. So having me work from his statements makes it extremely complicated. Please replay the clip I just used of him and tell me what he is saying because it sounds like he's telling us that limited vision, audio, and options are a result of found footage, as opposed to the fact that we have a nighttime based game with a relatively run-of-the-mill night vision camera. Found footage is not, and never will be, a viable video game genre because you will inherently have to make significant core changes to make it viable as a game and thus would no longer be found footage. The closest we can get is Resident Evil 7, and even they are cheating. I'm finding his reasoning here incredibly hard to follow. Outlast is a horror game about making a horror movie. It could function as either. Either would be good. But the deliberate hybridization of cinematic horror consumed passively, with real-time game horror consumed actively, makes Outlast notable and unique among both mediums. What? Outlast is not a game about making a horror movie at all. That is something I think you feel it was without supporting mechanics involved. You could make this statement about any horror game as long as you put a filter on top of it. This is incredibly weak as a notable piece of analysis for Outlast. When setting out to make a game about psychopaths chasing you in the darkness, the developers would have wanted you to have night vision to traverse several of the levels successfully. Now while it perhaps could be visible as a phone option or tactical goggles, it makes far more sense to simply have the character be a journalist, and he has the night vision as an option on the camera he would use regularly. Does that not make sense? But you think they were trying to hybridize the genres of video game horror and found footage in movies? That seems like not only a huge stretch to the imagination, but nothing supports this aside from the imagined fact that there is a video file to be seen at the end of the game. This is what I mean by abstract analysis. This holds no weight in the tangible aspects of the game. Each sequence in between automatic saves is like a take. Sometimes you're there for a while trying to get the take right, and sometimes you improv flawlessly. But when you stitch it together into the two hours or so your camcorder captures, it comes out to be a totally coherent and seamless found footage horror movie. Okay, firstly, that is literally an arbitrary number that counts upwards and gets reset every time you die or go to the last checkpoint. It doesn't mean anything. Secondly, you naturally assume that everyone will have held the camera up for two hours, and that two hours is the optimal length for a movie, and that there wouldn't be loads of useless shite recorded in this sequence of the people trying to look for batteries or at obstacles. 
Thirdly, if we were to take the arbitrary number climbing up as a literal piece of evidence that this camera is recording, then you do not record your notes or documents with the camera, meaning that you do not point the camera at the notes or the documents, so the person watching this completed imaginary file would not understand the characters involved or the story at hand, just a series of jump scares and exploring a blood-ridden asylum. And that to you would make a good horror movie? Finally, you said that it would be a coherent and seamless horror movie. What planet are you living on where that would be the case? If you literally stitched the footage together, the pieces of footage from only when the camera was recording, it wouldn't make a lick of sense. Nor would it be seamless. You would see jump cuts everywhere, and you would have to put up with the curiosity of the person holding the camera. Whatever they find interesting or worth contemplating, you now have to watch a random person play a game in pieces as opposed to a found footage film where everything's put together with purpose. I don't need to prove this, but I will anyway. You are wrong. I'm sorry, but when thinking about this, you haven't accounted for how people play video games, nor have you thought of how these clips actually come together. This whole sequence was taken from the first online recording in which I treated the game as something of a real experience, and I did my best to get immersed and absorb information much like a journalist would, or the first time anybody would have played this game on average. This video would be fantastic in court, as it is meant for narratively, but as an entertaining movie? Not even with the best editing. Even the thoughts and speech of the player would be completely mutilated if it were recorded by camera. Which, if we are taking this as literally as you are, then of course it would be. Take anyone's Let's Play and stitch together the parts where they hold the camera up. It's horrendous. And, uh, any of the indie games I played. Oh, I am playing through a camera. Hello. Miles Upshur. My nice press pass, I have night vision mo Light mouse button to raise the camcorder. All right. This way. Hello? All right, no. so, Miles Upshore. Okay, this is Miles Upshore reporting directly from Mount Massive Asylum. It seems to be awfully windy here. Zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. Yeah, I see that. Is there anything in there? What? Did I? That's eh, the start of something bad. <laughs> what is this? This is that movie. I didn't see the movie, but you remember the movie? Outbreak or Containment or... I forget what it's called. Ooh, this is gonna be good. See how it literally makes no sense and it's very hard to watch? As much as you had a novel idea, it doesn't make for meaningful entertainment in practice, and I'm disappointed you didn't take the time to edit a copy of your own playthrough to see what it would be like for yourself when championing this perspective so hard. To declare that Outlast has performed a hybridization of the genres and not even bother to see if that's true beyond concept. We're going to cover more of his points as we progress, but as you're probably very aware at this point, I do not find his video very analytical whatsoever. Regardless, that would be the assessment of found footage, so let's move on. Outlast is a very established story in that they make a strong attempt to tell you what is actually happening regularly. It isn't some vague nonsense that has no connecting scenes, like The Evil Within. No, it is an actual coherent tale that works as a functioning vehicle for the events that take place. But just how good is it, though? 
For those who don't know, you play as Miles Upshur. 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 It's just funny that everyone began their story description with a wiki entry, but hey, writing is hard. So let's go over these events, shall we? Outlast begins with Dr. Rudolf Wernicke and Dr. Alan Turing working together to write a paper about revolutionary technology. From that research, Wernicke discovered a use for nanotechnology, or more specifically, nanomachines. While Alan would progress with computers, Dr. Wernicke would then continue his work in Germany under the Nazis. Here he managed to reach success. Through inhumane torture, subjects are brought to a mental state that is even more powerful than the best of hope. Absolute horror. It allows patients to become nanomachine factories while hooked up to the morphogenic engine, and after receiving potentially years of torture both physically and mentally, these patients will be brought to a point of complete despair and pain. This allows them to astral project while connected to the morphogenic engine, and manipulate the nanomachines to create a cloud that can function as one large unit to show great strength and speed. Wernicke was successful in Germany, and this was expected to be applied for military use. When Wernicke's colleagues asked if they would also have the same fate if they were to kill themselves, he confirmed their beliefs and they committed suicide. Once Wernicke was the only survivor, he told stories of the Wall Rider to explain what had happened in that facility. Years later, the Murkoff Corporation, known for their interest in money, learned of Wernicke's work and hired him to spearhead the revival of his project at Mount Massive's Insane Asylum under the guise of simply pursuing charitable work. The asylum was recently bought by the Murkoff Corporation for this purpose. During his time there, patients were subjected to horrifying psychological and physical damage at the hands of the doctors, orderlies, and sometimes patients. As time moved on, Wernicke's Wall Rider project subjects were dying, or at the very least losing all sense of their cognitive faculties. A patient named Billy Hope managed to pull through and become a great candidate for the project, and it worked better than anyone could have hoped. The cloud of nanomachines being manipulated by Billy while attached to the morphogenic engine ransacked the asylum and eviscerated each of the workers and inmates alike. Upon investigating the asylum, thanks to a tip from a whistleblower, Miles Upshaw entered the asylum. After making his way through various parts of the asylum, he confronted and killed Billy by stopping his various life support systems. Leaving the Wall Rider without a guiding hand or a host, and thus the Wall Rider chose Miles for its new host. As Miles prepares to leave the asylum, he is shot down by several soldiers. As a result, the now sentient and self-sufficient Wall Rider kills them all, as far as we can tell, leaving the legacy of the Wall Rider up to question. So this story is clearly as contrived as you would imagine. We have quite a few suspension of disbelief requirements to be able to make it through. Firstly, throwing in Alan Turing seems like a random choice, but he is considered the grandfather of the modern computer, so perhaps they chose him to try and come across as more realistic? While I would argue it came across as quite the opposite. Moving from that, we have a very hard to swallow idea of nanomachine clouds being controlled by astral projection to become a weapon. To begin, let's first tackle how it's done. Patients need to be in a state of proximity to death, or absolute terror or horror, or whatever. How is this possible? Well, torture, pain, and being attached to the morphogenic engine several times, I would imagine. The reasoning for this is that it allows them to explain why the patients are so tortured and deformed. They have a name for them. It is Variance. This name simply means that they have some form of deformity on their body or mind thanks to the experimentation with the morphogenic engine. When the term variance is said for you for the first time in the game, it comes across as a lot more of an important issue, as if these people may have different powers or abilities, but really they're just psychopaths, and we have Chris, who is massive for reasons beyond being a variant, he was massive already. So with the reasoning for the blood and torture out of the way, we have the engine itself. From what I can gather, it functions as a source for the lead required for the nanomachines. Once they manipulate your biology to the point in which your cells will begin to create nanomachines, this likely is the material needed, but also the catalyst in controlling them while astroprojecting. Which, by the way, seems to me the most reasonable part of this whole thing. If we're to fully believe that astroprojection is a thing, and that it takes place tangibly, then adding nanomachines to the form that you take could very well end up looking like the Wall Rider. After those things are all accepted, the game is able to play itself out. Regardless, this story is rather weak. Let's try and go over why. We need to accept that nanomachines were a thing. Fine. We need to accept that pain, torture, and horror bring a person to be able to open a door to being able to control nanomachines through the morphogenic engine with this absolute nonsense, but fine. There are some things, however, that when you have accepted this stuff still just make no sense. Why is it that when Wernicke advised against this plan, and Murkoff understood that, and supported the goal, that they were completely unprepared for this result? 
They wanted to create a military-enabled superweapon that essentially behaved as an invincible ghost, but when they managed to pull that off, they were surprised that it actually was an invincible ghost. They had absolutely no way of containing it, it's just incredibly weak. Throughout the game, Mirkov is shown to have the power to simply make people disappear or just immediately admit them to the asylum themselves if they choose to, as well as conduct horrors upon their patients regularly. Are they beholden to anyone? Have they had a single inspection? Do the governing bodies actually know this place exists? How do they pass any sort of review, and why aren't their family members involved? Are we just going to assume that it's an evil corporation narrative that gets away with everything? One of the documents tries to explain this by mentioning that the whistleblower's wife was going to make noise about the company because of what they had done to Waylon, but it is clear that this isn't the case since the company basically threatened that she would face Waylon's healthcare costs if she complained. Care for what? Being in the asylum? She doesn't want him in the asylum, or to be a patient, so how would that shut her up? She wouldn't have to pay for shit if it was proven that he was sane, and that he was placed there unlawfully, which Waylon would be able to do. Apparently she said uncharitable things about the corporation, so she would probably be aware of how Waylon felt about the place. Speaking of which, why the hell did he blow the whistle while working? Why not do this when you get home, you fool? Like, even if you're on some kind of monthly commute where you come back way later, why not go to the police when you're free of this place? As the guy in the suit says, Somehow dumb enough to think that a borrowed laptop, onion router, and firewall patch would be enough to fool the world's leading supplier of biometric security. Stupid, Mr. Park. Anyway, back to the main story. I have a rather burning question. What did Miles expect to do if the asylum was fully functioning when he arrived? He finds the asylum is essentially unmanned and he is lucky to find an entrance, but what if there was a security guard waiting at the door? What then? If the game had been about breaking in regardless, then I could see it, but it just seems to be stupid by Miles that he just turns up thinking the asylum is, um, corrupted but fully functioning, and that he would just be able to get in if he said, yeah, I'm a freelance journalist. Since we know that the fall of the asylum takes place about two hours after the email is sent, so he couldn't have known about it. However, since we are running out of time, I will go as far as taking a little more of a positive look. Upon exploring the opening areas, we get a lot of things to enjoy, that being the colourful child drawing pictures inside the security booth that imply the humanity of the people who worked at the asylum, and the abandoned armoured trucks that are parked outside that will later explain where the soldiers came from. Not to mention that at the end of Whistleblower there is an additional one to explain where the last set of soldiers arrived to kill Miles. There really are a lot of small details in this game that add to the atmosphere as well as the environmental storytelling, and we will get to all of those, including gameplay, mechanics, characters and everything else as we progress this 10-part series. That's right, I managed to stretch Outlast as a critique into five hours. This was the first half hour, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will join me for the entire thing, folks. And thank you ever so much for waiting once again, I know it takes a long time, but hey, we're here. So let's enjoy it while we can. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.